So welcome to tonight's event, to the Petroleum Papers, Inside the Far-Right Conspiracy to Cover Up Climate Change with author Jeff Dimbicki. This is the premier webinar in the Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism's new series, The Far-Right's Energy Politics, Carbon Capital, Petronationalisms, and Anti-Environmental Media. Uh, what a wonderful turnout tonight. I think we, we, we had about 130 people registered and a lot of people joining us tonight. So thanks to you all for joining us. It's really great to know that you're interested in this important topic and the tremendous work that, that Jeff has done um, in, in completing this, this, this monograph and sharing it with the world. We at the Center for Hate, Bias, and Extremism organized this event with the support of the good folks and colleagues um, and advocates uh, of the Petrocultures Research Group the Energy Humanities Network, and the Climate Commons Working Group. Uh, I want to say a big thanks to the webinar's organizers and supporters. And to learn more about the research and outreach being done by the CHB and these groups, please check out their websites. So a little bit about Jeff and, and Jeff's work. Um, Jeff is an investigative uh, climate change journalist, originally from Alberta, Canada, home of the largest tar sand deposits in the world. Uh, drawing from extensive research and institutional analysis of confidential oil industry documents spanning decades, Jeff's new book reveals the convergence of big oil, the far right, and climate denial and doubt that stopped the world from preventing the climate crisis and transitioning toward a sustainable energy future. Um, Bill McGibbon praises Jeff's book as a truly needed compendium of big oil's endless lies. Um, I've got my copy of the book here. Uh, congratulations, Jeff. You can also get your copy for those of you in the audience that haven't yet on the Greystone Books Publisher website. And I'll also put that link in the chat bar in just a few moments from now. So a big congrats to you, Jeff, for your important work. We're really delighted that you've joined us for tonight's event. Um, tonight's events for folks in the audience is going to go like this. Jeff's going to speak for about 45 or 50 minutes uh, about the book's arguments. Um, and after that, we're going to have about 30 minutes for a moderated question and answer session. So for those of you that already use the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar room, great. Um, if you haven't yet, uh, you're going to just please click the Q&A box. If you have any questions that arise during Jeff's presentation, put them into the Q&A box and then I'll sort of tally those up. And then in the Q&A session, um, I'll be the intermediary of those questions and ask them directly to Jeff. So we'll take up those soon. But first, we've got our main attraction, which is Jeff and Jeff's book. So without further ado, uh, a warm welcome to you, Jeff. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you for that introduction. I'm just um, imagining some warm digital applause and, and cheering right now as I come walking out onto the stage, which happens to be my bedroom in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm really honored and, and thrilled to be doing one of the, or the, the first webinar in this series. And I, I think it's, it's kind of appropriate in a way because the, the book that I'm gonna be talking tonight, um, The Petroleum Papers, Inside the Far-Right Conspiracy to Cover Up Climate Change, is, is in a lot of ways a history book. Um, it's a history of, of the lies that the oil and gas industry has told about climate change going all the way back to the 1950s. And, and so I guess that's, that's, a, that's a good place to, to start my talk tonight. Um, so if, if, you can, if you can come travel back in, in time for me, time with me for, for a moment, I, I want to work back from, from that, that historical event in the 1950s where I start my book all up into the present. And I, I think it's, it's really crucial to have sort of a long-term view of the climate crisis, because although the public has only really become aware of the crisis in a big way since the late 80s and early 1990s, um, and really come to appreciate its catastrophic impacts, I would argue, only much more recently um, over the last decade. The oil and gas industry has, has known about the damages related to its products much, much longer. And so that's, that's why I want to start this back in 1959. So 1959 is, is the year that the oil and gas industry in the United States decided to celebrate its 100 year birthday. It held this birthday celebration at Columbia University in New York. Um, it was a conference called Energy and Man. 
So at the Energy and Man conference, it was it was a big deal, as you could imagine. There were all sorts of oil and gas executives, heads of trade associations, politicians, various VIPs, and, and they all went into this library um, at Columbia University to congratulate themselves on all the technological advances um, that had been made over the past hundred years. And, and they really wanted to, to look forwards toward the future. So one of the keynote speakers at this event was um, a scientist named Edward Teller. You may be familiar with Edward Teller because he's one of the people who helped invent the atomic bomb. So Edward Teller is, is up there in, in, in front of this room of people and, and he starts talking about this, this new planetary threat that he's been researching. And so he says something to the effect of, you know, I've, I've spent my career looking at the prospect of, of nuclear war, um, but I've come to realize that there is this greater global threat that could pose even more catastrophic impacts than the misuse of nuclear weapons. And that's something called the greenhouse gas effect. And so from, from what I can tell, this is probably the first time many people in the room were hearing about something called the greenhouse gas effect. And Edward Teller knows that too. So he, he, leads, he leads the room through a very basic science lesson. And he says, when, when you pull oil and gas out of the ground and then burn it in a, in a car engine, for example, that releases emissions into the atmosphere. Those emissions um, are warming the Earth's climate and eventually there could be changes so profound and far reaching um, that the polar ice caps will melt and coastal cities all over the world could flood, including the very city where the oil industry was now gathered to celebrate its birthday, New York City. And, and so like what, what a wild thing for these people to be hearing. I could only imagine what an oil executive in the late 1950s is thinking, like, here's this very respected scientist who is in, you know, no way a, or an environmentalist, a term that hadn't even been invented yet. This is the guy who literally invented weapons of mass destruction, and he's delivering this very credible warning about um, this dangerous, unseen gas related to oil and gas. So we, there, there is no historical record of, of what the attendees thought or how they reacted, but we do know what some of them did after that meeting. So one of the people up on stage next to Edward Teller, his name is Robert Dunlop. And at the time he was an executive at the company Sun Oil. So they were an oil and gas company based in the American Northeast. Sun Oil had, had very ambitious expansion plans, however, and one of the areas that it was looking to, to expand into was Canada, um, Northern Alberta to be specific. And the reason Sun Oil wanted to expand into Northern Alberta is because it had heard tales about a vast reserve of oil rivaling what was in Texas or, or even Saudi Arabia. People, people had known about these tar sands, as they were called then, for decades and decades and decades, but nobody had really figured out a way that the oil from the tar sands could be extracted economically. And so Sun Oil thought that, that it could be the first. So four years after um, Edward Teller gave his warning about climate change to the oil and gas industry. Robert Dunlop was up in Northern Alberta helping set up the very first commercial oil sands operation. Sun Oil later became the company Suncor in Canada, which is now the largest oil and gas producer in the country. And, and I like to me, learning about that was, was so significant because it, it told me that, um, you know, before this massive oil industry, the oil sands was even started decades and decades ago, key people involved with the creation of that industry 
already knew that the oil which would be pulled out of the ground could destabilize the global climate. Like this, this is the late 1950s, the early 60s. The general public was, was decades away from any sort of basic understanding of climate change. And, and the oil and gas industry already knew. And, and another reason I find this historical event so fascinating is because of, of the politics that were associated with it. So Sun Oil at the time was also led by Howard Pugh. And, and Pew um, was, was quite well known at the time for his fervent anti-communist politics. He's, he's someone we might now call um, a libertarian. Um, and he, he held you know, very strong anti-government views um, during the, the 1930s. He was extremely opposed to, to FDR's New, New Deal policies, which he saw as a sort of the, the onslaught of, of godless communism. And, and one of the reasons that Pew and Sun Oil were interested in tapping this massive oil reserve up in Canada is because they saw this as a way um, to create geopolitical power for the United States. If the US had this large source of oil in a friendly ally next door, then this would allow it to have the power to resist the Soviet Union and the sort of communist radical politics that Pew feared for much of his career. And, and so at this, at this very early stage, um, this, this kind of sets the tone for, for a lot of the oil and gas politics to follow. You have executives with knowledge about climate change deciding to go ahead and tap huge oil and gas reserves anyway. And you have this all kind of informed by this, this anti-government sort of extreme version of economic libertarianism. And so I'm I'm from Alberta and and I I grew up in in the 90s there so this this was decades after all of these decisions had already been made and when I grew up um I was I was surrounded by oil not not just metaphorically but literally I lived in East Edmonton and my family was just a a short drive from the Strathcona oil refinery so that's this this sprawling complex operated by Imperial Oil, which is a subsidiary of Exxon in Canada. And, and so strangely, the, the refinery was located on the, the side of a, on the top of a ravine. And at the bottom of a ravine, there was a park and, and a playground. And my, my family would go there all the time, sometimes once a week during the warmer months. And so I, I distinctly remember um, as a child, playing on the monkey bars with my brother and, and looking up to the ravine and seeing um, refinery stacks shooting 30 foot flames into the air. And as a kid, that didn't seem weird to me. It, it just seemed normal, the same way that the hockey team was named the Edmonton Oilers or that family and friends worked in the oil and gas industry. Now, when I look back and I, I see pictures of, of that playground and, and the refinery, it, it all seems rather <laughs> apocalyptic to me. But that, that's what I mean when I say I, I grew up in an environment literally surrounded by oil. Of course, I have a, a bit of a, a rebellious streak. So I, I decided to become um, a climate journalist after I graduated from high school. But but I, I, didn't, I didn't really get into the, the sort of disinformation reporting that I do now um, until a few years later. And, and the spark for that really was learning for the first time about the Koch brothers. So it seems hard to imagine now, um, but, but for, for a long time, the, the Kochs were, were very obscure business people, despite being some of the richest people in the entire world. But uh, uh, around the, the 2010 timeframe, I'm trying to remember the exact year, that, that was when Jane Mayer wrote um, an expose on the Cokes in the New Yorker. 
and and she sort of explained for the first time how these two oil and gas billionaires had used their vast fortune to fund a variety of, of very far right think tanks and other organizations. And, and one of the, the key goals um, of, 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 their, of, their, um, of their giving of their fortune was to fund campaigns to make people think that climate change isn't real. And so I, I, was, I was shocked to read um, Jane Meyer's article in The New Yorker and, and other reporting in, in outlets like um, D Smog. Um, and and what, what really shocked me when I, when I started looking into it a little bit deeper were, were the very strong connections between the Koch's propaganda machine and the oil and gas industry that I'd grown up with in Alberta. And so I learned, for example, that the Cokes operate an oil refinery in Minnesota called the Pine Bend Refinery. And it's one of the largest refiners of oil sands crude in the entire United States. Recently, the, the reporter Christopher Leonard, he published this great book called Coke Land, and it goes into further detail about the refinery. Um, the refinery was, was one of the first big businesses that the two Koch brothers took over from their father. And from a very early stage in their business empire, um, it was incredibly profitable. One of the reasons it was so profitable is because the Kochs were able to access um, lower quality oil from Canada, including from the oil sands, which had higher impurities and needed to be processed more extensively. They could take this oil, um, buy it at a low price, refine it using their specialized coking equipment, and then sell it at a very high margin in the form of gasoline and other products in the Midwest. And so as, as Leonard details in his book, um, this refinery helped set in motion the businesses that later led to the empire that um, Charles and David Koch later controlled. And one executive at the company referred to the refinery as the company's cash cow. And so after I learned that the, the province that I grew up in had played a very substantial role in, in funding this massive um, climate disinformation machine, that's, that's kind of when I decided that I wanted to, to, to devote myself to, to uncovering the self-interested lies told by oil and gas companies. And so fast forward a few years, um, and, and I heard about this huge trove of, of documents that had been recently made public by the media outlet D Smog about the company Imperial Oil. And so I, I knew that point, I knew by that point that um, Exxon, Imperial's parent company, had studied climate change in the 1960s and 70s. And, and that fact was revealed through really incredible investigative reporting in outlets like Inside Climate News and the Los Angeles Times. But these, these imperial documents got even a bit more granular about what Exxon and Imperial knew about climate change and what they decided to do with that information. So the, the, the documents, they, they come from this archive in Calgary. And, and they cover Imperial's thinking on climate change um, going all the way from, from the late 60s up until the 2000s. And, and so to me, it was, it was, it was fascinating to have, have access to this resource because you can, you can almost see the company's responses to the catastrophic things it was learning evolve in real time. And so this, this trove of documents, many of which were marked confidential, um, that's, that's what the title of my book refers to, the Petroleum Papers. And so people, people ask me like, okay, you, you read through all these documents, was, was there anything in there that, that really jumped out at you, that, that shocked you or, or disturbed you? And I replied to them that, that yes, <laughs> there, there was, there's, there's one document in particular that, that I, I, I keep thinking about. Um, it's, it's sort of haunted me in a way. And, 
This document is, is from 1993, and it was produced by Imperial Oil only five years after James Hansen had testified to Congress about the dangers of climate change, which for the first time um, put the greenhouse gas effect into the mind of the public through mainstream media outlets like the New York Times. So that was 1988. Five years later, Imperial produces this document, and the document contains Imperial's thinking about how to fix climate change. So it's, it's, a, it's a very early date. The public is just waking up to this crisis, and Imperial Oil is so advanced in its understanding of climate change, it's, it's trying to think through how we as a society would get it under control. So they, they hired an economics modeling firm to look at the economic impacts of various climate policies that it had identified. And, and one of those policies was a price on carbon. So Imperial wanted to know what would happen if the Canadian government imposed um, a price on the carbon pollution released across the entire economy. What it learned as reported in this document is that such a policy, if designed right, could achieve quote unquote, approximate stabilization of CO2 emissions in Canada. So basically we, we would stop climate change from getting worse and then emissions would start to decline. Um, we, we would have the emergency under control. Imperial also looked at what the economic impacts of that might be. And, and it found that there, while there might be an economic hit in, in some carbon intensive areas of the country, overall, it's, it's possible that um, the impact might be positive. And, that, and that's because the Canadian government and other jurisdictions would, would get so much revenue from taxing carbon that they could use it to fund a massive green infrastructure buildout, which would create all sorts of jobs and new industries across the country. However, Imperial also learned that such a policy would be specifically bad for its own operations in the oil sands. And, and so I Imperial had, had real reason to fear about the profits it would lose because along with Sun Oil, which became Suncorp, Imperial was also one of the very early um, companies to set up a commercial oil sands operation and it had invested billions and billions of dollars trying to figure out the formula of how to economically extract this oil in Northern Alberta. And so in the early 90s, Imperial learned that um, a policy which, which could fix climate change in Canada would cost it over $800 million in lost revenues. And so what, what did Imperial decide to do with this information? Well, it created um, a list of talking points for executives at Imperial and Exxon, instructing them on how to spin the knowledge about climate solutions. It told those executives to stress to people in media and the government that um, climate solutions would be horrible for the economy, they would, they would destroy growth, send all sorts of people out of work. And it also told them to, to stress that these solutions had unknown environmental benefit. They might not even fix the problem. Of course, this, this directly contradicted what, what Imperial itself had acknowledged in this document. And so to me, this, this, this was just so shocking and mind-blowing. Um, decades ago, when um, we were first waking up to climate change as a society, Imperial knew what it would take to fix the emergency. It, it knew that this could create new jobs and industries, and it decided to, to spin that knowledge and, and make these climate policies look really bad. And, and that, that sort of, you know, their, their advanced knowledge of this climate solution really allowed them to set the terms of the debate. We've, we've spent you know, decades now arguing about whether environmental policy will kill the economy. And that, that wasn't something that just, just happened randomly. That was due to the deliberate efforts of companies like Imperial. And then several years after this document was produced, um, Imperial's executive was arguing in public that climate change 
isn't even real. In letters to shareholders, um, Robert Peterson said, the link between burning fossil fuels and greenhouse gases was unproven. And Imperial later, um, on the eve of Canada trying to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, Imperial helped bring a group of some of the biggest climate change deniers in the world to Ottawa um, to do a press conference for national journalists disputing the science behind climate change. So it's interesting for me looking at the, the guest list of this Imperial event, because I recognized a lot of the names. A lot of them were, were Americans. There were people like Patrick Michaels. And Patrick Michaels I knew because he had appeared in the early 90s at what I believe is one of the first conferences ever dedicated to climate change denial. So that conference um, took place in Washington, DC, and it was set up um, by the, the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank that had been founded by the Kochs, um, by the Koch brothers, and, and received tons and tons of funding from them over the years. So at the conference, it, it wasn't a large group, but there were, there were people like Patrick Michaels and, and other sort of contrarian academics. And, and they got together to debate, um, you know, what, what should the conservative position be on climate change? And th this, this was a real like live question at that point, because through much of the, um, the, the 80s and 90s, environmental policy wasn't really seen as, as a directly partisan thing. You'd had leaders like George H.W. Bush who passed um, really ambitious sulfur rain legislation um, that had extremely positive economic benefits all across the U.S. There was Brian Mulroney in Canada um, who had taken the lead on similarly ambitious environmental legislation. And and so these, these academics gathered at the Coke Industries-backed conference in Washington. They, they were debating this, this new idea of, of climate change that the public suddenly was now discussing. And so in, in a pamphlet um, produced for the conference, which, which I later read through, um, they, they sort of spell this out explicitly. It's, and, and the language actually is, is even a little bit defensive. There's, there's a line to the effect of like, what, like what, what is the reason that the conservatives would, would oppose um, taking action on, on global climate change? They were sort of anticipating that, that the reader um, of this conference pamphlet might, might be you know, seriously wondering why conservatives cared so much about this issue. And, and then the, the pamphlet went on to state that, you know, conservatives should care about climate change because it's an unproven hypothesis and it will result in one of the greatest losses of freedom ever experienced by humankind. It's, it's, it's so interesting to me that this early climate denial conference um, was backed by the Koch brothers who'd made their fortune um, in large part due to refining Canadian oil sands, because the, the industry, is, as I mentioned earlier, um, had, had really gotten its start with Howard Pugh, another libertarian who saw development as the oil sands as one of his great um, life ambitions. And Howard Pugh, in fact, um, in a recent piece, in a recent essay in Politico, was, was sort of described as a, 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 a Koch brothers prototype. Um, He's, he sort of created the mold of, of the far-right libertarian oil and gas businessman who gets involved in right-wing politics. And then the Koch brothers, of course, um, became a much more famous example of that decades and decades later. But you, you can see throughout all of those years, um, there are these, these ideological threads that sort of run alongside the development of Canada's oil and gas industry. And so I, I, I bring up all this history just to show that, um, you know, none, none, of the, none of the political issues that we're dealing with around climate change are new. This, this idea that, that conservatives always bring up 
um, especially in Canada these days, that climate legislation will destroy the economy. That, that idea actually had to be created and tested out. Um, and, and there had to be um, you know, economic modeling to go behind that and, and profits at stake. And then a strategy by companies like Imperial to, to disseminate these ideas to the public. And similarly, this, this whole debate that we've had for decades, this, this pointless debate about whether climate change is real, which still continues through people like Jordan Peterson, um, that too had to be invented. The controversy had to be created and it had to be discussed at a very early stage at venues like that early conference, climate denial conference in Washington, DC. And I, I also bring up all of this history because um, the, the oil and gas industry is still playing what I think is, is a bad faith role in the approach to climate action. Um, in, in Canada now, the, the top six oil producing companies have come together to create an organization called the Pathways Alliance. And so the Pathways Alliance um, says in, in full page advertisements in outlets like the Toronto Star that they are committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions in their operations by 2050. And they, they advertise aggressively on, on Facebook and, and in TV ads. Um, but what, what the organization doesn't mention is, is that it's also a registered lobby group. And it has access to the highest levels of the federal government. In fact, I, I, looked, I looked it up recently in the federal lobbyist registrar, and the Pathways Alliance has met nearly 200 times with federal Canadian officials since 2019 when it was formed. I also, um, I also got access recently to, to presentations that the Pathways Alliance has given to the Canadian government about its net zero plan. And, and what the Alliance is, is not telling the public in its advertisements is that this net zero plan is actually a strategy to increase production in the oil sands, to produce even more oil and sell it to foreign markets. And you may be wondering, well, how, how is it possible that the industry could get to net zero carbon emissions yet be producing more oil than they are now? And, and that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a good question, I think. Um, but, but basically what, what the Pathways Alliance um, is, is, is attempting to do um, is, is reduce carbon emissions at the actual operations themselves. The oil sands plants in Northern Alberta, which are a very significant source of emissions, but the Pathways Alliance has no plan to address the emissions that come from actually burning the oil that they produce. And the emissions of, of burning that oil account for um, about 80% of all the emissions associated with a barrel of oil. So you could have a situation where, where Pathways and the oil sands producers are reducing carbon emissions at their operations in Alberta advertising themselves as being some of the greenest oil companies on the planet and selling millions and millions of barrels of oil every week to countries like China and India. And, and, and so to me, this, this just shows that um, when, it comes to, when it comes to addressing the climate emergency, the, the oil and gas industry really is a bad faith actor, and it, it always has been. It's, it's known about the impact of its emissions for decades and decades and decades since at least the 1950s in some cases. And, and it, hasn't, it hasn't used that knowledge to address that problem. In fact, it's, it's used that knowledge to, to craft campaigns and lobbying strategies that can prevent action from being taken. And, and so people sometimes ask if, if writing this book was a totally depressing experience for me. And, and when, I, when I thought about that question, I realized that it, it had actually had 
the opposite effect to me. I found that going through all of these industry documents and, and discovering the true role that oil and gas companies had played in spreading climate disinformation, I, I, found, I found that kind of invigorating in a way. And, and I felt full of agency afterwards. And, and the reason for that is for, for as long as I can remember, there's been I, this idea that we are all sort of equally responsible for causing climate change. There's this idea that, um, you know, be, because we drive and live in modern industrial society and, and heat our homes, um, you know, the, the, the we're all complicit in, in this climate emergency that we're now experiencing. And, and, and I don't wanna say that those sorts of things don't have an impact on the atmosphere because they do, but, in, in a world where we're all responsible for climate change, then, then nobody is truly responsible. And, and I, I don't think that's accurate. Um, through, my, through my research for this book, I've seen how at, at key moments when we could have gotten the emergency under control, the oil and gas industry aggressively ramped up its disinformation efforts and deliberately sabotaged policies that can make a difference. And so I, I, I wanna give you one, you know, particularly egregious example of that. So in, in the late 2000s, um, I believe we, we had a real chance to get the climate emergency under control. Um, Barack Obama had just been elected and he was, he was promising wide ranging um, cap and trade legislation that would have put a price on carbon across the US economy. It wasn't, it wasn't a perfect policy by any means, um, but it would have been one of the most ambitious things the US has ever done. And so there, there was real fear in Canada about what this might mean and, and how it might impact the oil and gas industry. But it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't just Obama's climate policies that I, that I think showed a way to, to fix the emergency. Climate change was becoming such an issue of public concern in the late 2000s that, that even the denial campaigns of oil companies weren't quite working the same way anymore. And, and you had a lot of prominent conservatives saying that they had woken up to the threat and they wanted to take it seriously. And, and one of the most significant of, that, of those people um, was Rupert Murdoch, the, the head of News Corp, um, which, which for a time um, owned Fox News. And, and so Rupert Murdoch, through his empire of, of conservative newspapers and, and TV channels all over the world, um, including media outlets like the, the Wall Street Journal, um, Murdoch really had the power to, to set public opinion among very hard to reach conservatives on climate change. And, and in the late 2000s, Murdoch announced that, that he had sort of absorbed the science for the first time and, and he felt that um, climate change really was a big deal and that he wanted to, to help address it. So Mur Murdoch gave a speech um, at News Corp headquarters saying that the company was going to go carbon neutral and that he would use all his media properties to broadcast pro-environmental messages, which is, is sort of just incredible when you think about it. Um, and, and Rupert Murdoch, even at the time, he, he gave an interview to the environmental news outlet Grist, and, and he said he was, he was going to talk directly with Fox News personalities like Bill O'Reilly and Sean Hannity, and he was going to impress on them the importance of raising awareness about climate change. Of course, that didn't exactly happen. <laughs> and, and one of the main reasons for that, um, and one of the, the reasons that I included the word conspiracy in my book is because the, the oil and gas industry really, really didn't like all of this. They, they feared what would happen to their profits if the American government implemented wide ranging climate legislation um, while a company like News Corp tried to rally conservatives in favor of aggressive climate action. And so what happened was um, 
Oak Industries started funding efforts through one of its groups, Americans for Prosperity, to create um, a grassroots anti-government movement that would create as, as much stress and political opposition for the Obama administration as possible. And, and that became known as the Tea Party. A lot of the Tea Party rallies were initially about health care, but they were soon directed towards Obama's cap and trade legislation. Um, to the extent that when the Tea Party re released a list of its top political demands, um, stopping cap and trade legislation was right at the top. And so as, as Fox News reported on these Tea Party rallies, it realized it was getting um, huge ratings and excitement from its viewers. And so it, it quickly dropped any idea that it was going to take climate change seriously. And in fact, there was a memo sent out by one of its news directors instructing staff um, to deliberately um, play up the uncertainties in climate science when reporting on the issue. So as that was happening, the Stephen Harper government in Canada was leading a full-scale offensive against aspects of Obama's climate plan. And, and one of the policies that the, the oil sands industry really hated was something called a low carbon fuel standard. So this is a policy that, that would attempt to, to clean up the, the fuels used in vehicles across the United States. And there was a real fear that if this thing was implemented nationally, it could cut the market for oil sands by potentially a third. And so um, the, the Harper government, um, through its embassy in the United States, started teaming up with oil lobbyists and creating strategies for how to push back against this low carbon fuel standard. And so at one point, actually, I, I obtained through a freedom of information request, um, about 300 personal emails um, between Alberta's diplomat in Washington, DC, this guy named Gary Marr, and, and an oil and gas lobbyist named Michael Watley. And, and in those emails, they described this strategy of, of creating um, what looked like a groundswell of public opposition to the low carbon fuel standard um, that in fact was, was supported behind the scenes by many of the largest companies operating in the oil sands. And, and this, this policy was, was effective. They, in the emails, they, they cheered each other on as, as one fuel standard after another was defeated at the state level. And then at one point, the, the lobbyist brags to the, the Canadian diplomat that um, his efforts had led to a low carbon fuel standard dying an ugly partisan death on the Senate floor. I'm, I'm quoting directly from the document. And, and so by the time we get to 2010, 2011, um, there's so much political opposition to Obama's climate plan that, that the Senate realizes it cannot pass it. The legislation dies. Fox News is, is now more radical than ever about climate change. It's pushing outright denial in its broadcast. There's this huge, fired up, radical, far-right Tea Party movement um, that had been sort of accelerated by oil and gas money that was now looking for its next political target. Um, and, and the oil sands industry was able to keep exporting its products to the US without fear that some law would cut the market. And so that's, that's what I mean when I say that we're not all equally responsible for this crisis. Um, you know, in, in Vancouver, I used, to I used to own a car and, and I would drive occasionally and that released emissions into the atmosphere. But those emissions did not have the same contribution to our climate emergency as creating a fake grassroots movement to destroy the most substantial climate legislation in North American history. It's just not equivalent. And so I, I, I think that's, that's really, I hope the, the message that the people take away from this talk and from my book, um, that solving climate change is, is not some impossible thing that we have to invent all of this technology to do. We, we have all the solutions at hand and, and we've, we've had them around for a long time. 
Imperial Oil knew the solutions were there back in 1993. And, and we can fix climate change in a way that doesn't inflict economic harm on people or regions. A well-designed climate policy would make us more prosperous, it would create better paying jobs for people, and it would make us more competitive in the global economy. And so I, I think really we should see the oil and gas industry as, as one of the main barriers preventing us from getting to that future. And you know, when, when we talk about this industry, it's it's a relatively small handful of companies um, with, with executives who, who have addresses and and names. We're we're not we're not talking about a ton of people right here. But it's, it's an industry that has managed to consolidate and hold on to political power for decades and decades and decades. And, and I think if people find creative ways to get around that block in our politics on climate change, then we could start seeing solutions to the crisis accelerate very, very fast. And, and so I'm, I'm going to leave it there for now and, and take any questions you might have about all of this. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jeff, um, for that that informative and, and at points very infuriating uh, presentation and overview of the book. I think that gives a really helpful intro to the uh, investigative journalism that you produced here um, in the petroleum papers. And uh, I think we can now move on to the, the question and answer session. I see a few. And, and what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll read those out to you, Jeff. And I've got a few questions of my own that I might present if we don't have as many folks participating in this process. But everybody in the audience right now, uh, you're warmly welcome, if you haven't already, to, to again add your question to the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your Zoom window. And I'll uh, share those with Jeff. Um, so, so, so please, please go ahead and do that. But for the first uh, question, um, and I think you took this up briefly in the presentation, but you might say more about this. What was the key sort of institutional or archival source that you mined for the research you, you, you present in your book? And how are you able to access the petroleum papers? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And the, the story of how this stuff becomes public is, is always really interesting to me as a researcher and, and journalist. And, and so specifically for this book, um, these, these files about Imperial Oil's climate change positions, they were made public by an organization called DSMOG. And so I, I, I still do writing for, for DSMOG and they're, they're a great um, independent journalistic outlet. And they sort of do the deep dive investigative research um, that can be quite rare these days, especially in Canadian media. And so, um, after the initial reporting about Exxon had taken place, the reporting that showed Exxon studied climate change in the 70s, um, through a tip, the, some, some journalists at, at DSMOG heard that there was a big archive of documents um, in Calgary at this, at this oil and gas archive. And, and so some of the, the journalists went there and, and spent days going through these, these dusty boxes and sort of pulling files um, and photocopying them, and and after a while they they had they had sort of um, digitally scanned hundreds and hundreds of these, um, and so they they put them online. But it was it was kind of a it's it was sort of a weird thing for for journalists to write about. There was there was a few stories initially, and then then the interest kind of faded. And and the reason it was it was a bit weird is because um, Americans just, they didn't recognize the name Imperial Oil. It, it just didn't have the resonance of, of Exxon or, or something more recognizable, even though Imperial Oil is a subsidiary of Exxon. So there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a ton of interest um, in U.S. media. And, and in Canada, the, the story of oil and gas companies studying climate change and then hiding the evidence, it, it had never really taken off the same way as, as it did in the US for various reasons. So there, there wasn't really um, a context that reporters could, that, that these documents would, would make sense to reporters with. And so because I was in, I was living in New York, but I'm, I'm still a Canadian and I'd grown up there, 
I, I had sort of this rare, you know, cross-border perspective. I, I could sort of see the relevance of these, these documents in a way that someone just in either country might not have. And, and so that's when I decided to start going through every single one of them. And that became the basis for, for my early book proposal. Thanks for that, uh, Jeff. Um, I see a lot of really, really interesting questions that um, you know, largely speak to what's to be done in response to these forms of climate denial and doubt and disinformation, and misinformation. But be before I get onto that, I, I want to ask you uh, perhaps more of a, a, a personal political question. Um, I really appreciate how you know reflexive and thoughtful you are when connecting the focus of this book to your own experience growing up in Alberta. And I'm just curious, you know, you live in New York now, you still have a presence, of course, in the Canadian media and elsewhere, but have you presented the findings of your research to folks and maybe the community that, that you grew up in or in the surrounding areas? And, and, and if so, what's been the response? Uh, have you won them to your position or is it still quite a lot of resistance there? Um, I mean, it's obviously it's it's a bit more fraught talking about this stuff right in, in the heart of oil country, but I, I did do a presentation this fall in Calgary and it was it was probably one of the most interesting book events that that I've done, um, and it was it was it was in person. It was in the the basement of this this library downtown, and and we got what I thought was actually a pretty good crowd, probably about forty or fifty people or so. And and in fact, you know, what what I loved about that talk is 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 people came in a, a little bit. The, they they weren't hostile, but but people were like, okay, like you you really got to make your case. <laughs> I'm I'm interested in this, but but I want to hear the evidence. I I don't just want to hear wild claims being made about the oil and gas industry because Al Albertans um, can be very defensive to outsiders coming in and and telling them what to do. And and so I I just I just went through the history of the book and it was I I almost tried to do it like a like a legal deposition um, was I I mentioned the specific documents I gave the context and at and at the end of the presentation um, a few people came up to me and and they told me that that they currently worked at oil companies in Calgary and and they said that they had found the presentation really interesting and useful and they were going to go out and buy the book. And, and so to me, actually, that was that was the biggest compliment that I that I could have gotten. Um, because it it showed me that, you know, what what I'm talking about here isn't it if it, it can sometimes feel like it's making this this big political statement because there aren't a lot of people saying these things, but it, it actually isn't an ideological argument. Um, it's it's based on a specific business strategy. That these that these companies adopted in order to deal with the growing threat of climate change, um, and and there's hard documentary evidence for for all of the stuff that's that's inside the book, and and interestingly, um, there's been some polling down in the United States about um, how Republicans and and Democrats react to the knowledge that oil and gas companies deliberately lied to them, um, and. One of the most fascinating things about that polling is, is that when Republicans learn about this, it, it actually really pisses them off. And, and there's a large jump in the percentage of people who wanna hold the oil and gas industry accountable once they learn how much they've been lied to. And what's even more fascinating is that some of these people are self-identified climate change deniers. They don't even think that the science behind it is real but they just hate the idea of someone hiding information or trying to spin them. And, and so that's that's kind of a long answer to your question, but. Yeah, I really appreciate that. No, th thanks, Jeff. So I, I see a few questions in the queue that again are speaking to the bigger context of strategies and tactics of, of resisting or challenging these issues, but there's actually more pertaining to the specifics and the details of the work. So I'll take those up first. So uh, I've got a question here. I'm wondering if anything in the trove of documents you've analyzed shows direct collaboration between the Coke or US related individuals, companies or orgs and Canadian companies, individuals or orgs, especially with regard to the AstroTurf groups um, in Canada 
in the mid to late 2010s, thinking about extractive populist movements led by the CAPP, Yellow Vest Canada. So do we see, I guess, just to paraphrase, like a cross-border energy industry alliance between US-based and Canadian-based energy companies in the carbon sector that are funding these sort of populist nationalist campaigns um, and, and trying to do everything they can to stop um, the energy transition we need. Are you seeing these connections, maybe Yellow Vest being an example of that? I mean, there, there, there are a lot of cross-border connections. Um, there, there was the campaign that I was talking about against the low carbon fuel standard. So that, that was really waged on, on both sides of the border and, and using the resources of the Canadian embassy in the United States. Um, and at, at that point in time, a lot of the big companies in the oil sands were international. Um, like um, Shell, for example, BP, Total, a lot of those, a lot of those major players um, have have left, and the um, the industry is is a lot more um, is is controlled now by more by national companies. So it's become more of a, a domestic industry. But it, you know, in in terms of like the wider ideological battle against climate legislation and, and just the the idea of of a government that should pass that legislation um, there's there's a, a a network of of think tanks across Canada that have been really instrumental in eroding the public's trust um, in government and democracy and and so for example the the Fraser Institute might be one of the most famous, of those think tanks, and and for decades they've pushed the idea that um, government is is sort of the, the source of all evil in the country, and we need to deregulate and privatize. So Fraser Institute has has received funding over the years from from Coke Industries um, and and also from from Exxon, but one one of the other ways that there's 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 sort of you know cross border connections. Is, is that um, um, a number of the most prominent um, climate denial think tanks in Canada um, are, are linked to think tanks in the US through an organization called the Atlas Network. And so there's the Atlas Network is, is based in, um, in Virginia and it, it comprises 400 of, of some of the most Conserv influential conservative think tanks all across the world. Um, and so that, that network was started in the 70s um, by um, a former industrial chicken farmer from the United Kingdom. And, and he came over to North America. He set up the Fraser Institute. He set up the Manhattan Institute in New York. And he set up one in, in San Francisco. And, and so um, much many many of the atlas networks members were some of the loudest um voices promoting climate change denial throughout the 90s and 2000s um you had the the heritage foundation in in the united states um the manhattan institute which which shaped the policy views of presidents like george w bush and then in Canada, you had the, the Fraser Institute and, and organizations such as the Frontier Center for Public Policy, which is still holding um, events saying that the science of climate change is unsettled. And so through the Atlas Network, organizations on, on both sides of the border um, collaborate and, and coordinate their, their activities. So I, I think there's, there's a lot of learning that's, that's done between Canada and the US on this sort of stuff and, and a lot of logistical and, and financial support. Oh, very interesting. I mean, it, it sort of speaks to the, I guess, concept that we're reading quite a lot about today with foreign influence uh, in, in some respects, yeah. Um, there's a really thoughtful you know, uh, question about the psychology of oil industry executives. And um, the, the, the attendee says, you said, uh, you know, petroleum executives are people with addresses, they must have families, they must be generally reasonable or cognizant of the problems of the world in some way or another. They must be seeing what's going on in terms of global warming and its consequences of extreme weather and species lost. How can they be so loyal to their industry and be sacrificing their children and grandchildren in the future? 
how can they hold such contradictory or opposite views at the same time? Like, how would we go about explaining that contradictory consciousness or psychology uh, of the people that are basically part of the companies that are backing these disinformation and misinformation campaigns? It's, it's a very good question. I would I would love to ask an executive um, about about that very thing, but um, I I sort of got a little bit of insight into that through. Um, interviewing um one of someone who became one of one of the big stories in in my book um and and his name is is Enrique um and and for over a decade um he was he was a real like trusted engineer at um Exxon in the US he he also worked for several years on on projects in the oil sands and 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 he's kind of an an example of of that very thing in action because he's he's a very smart you know conscientious scientist he also had a family he cared about the future um he cared about the environment he was he was not um ideological or sort of hardcore libertarian in any way he's he's just someone who thought of himself as a person who who follows the facts and and so i was i was asking him how he he reconciled all these things while working at at exxon and and he said, when 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 you're in the company, there's there's this idea in in the culture there that um, the the world is not a black and white place. Um, we're going to need oil for decades to come. We're also going to need climate solutions. And it was Exxon's job to be in that gray area and use its expertise to solve the world's big energy problems. And and he said, you know, it it actually it, it felt exciting to be on those teams because. Um, they were flying all over the world. There was incredibly smart people he was working with. Um, they would work together through the night on these these problems and have parties to celebrate when when they um, found the solutions. But but he realized the longer he spent in the company was that they they weren't actually interested in in the climate part of of that equation. Um, and and Enrique told me at one point he he sort of took Exxon at its word and he he volunteered for this unit that was studying carbon capture and storage, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, and and Enrique spent spent a long time working at that unit. He came up with with solutions. He ran the numbers on them, um, but when he tried to take that upstairs to executives, he he said they they showed him almost almost no interest at all in that. Um, and and the unit. Just didn't receive the funding or company support that the the oil parts did. And then Enrique started to read some of that investigative journalism that I mentioned about um, how Exxon had lied about its own climate knowledge, and and this this totally shocked him. Um, and and so he he printed out a lot of these articles. He had them on his desk at work. Um, he he tried to engage other people at the company in conversations. He said it didn't go very well. <laughs> Um, and then there was a company event where employees could ask questions of executives in early 2020. And Enrique got up and he challenged a few of the executives about the company's role in promoting climate denial and asked, when are they going to get serious about um, actually fixing climate change? And, and so he, he claims afterwards, and I think there's evidence for this, that the, the company forced him out after that. Um, they... They they basically put him on corporate pro probation, um, threatened to fire him at any moment, and he he left the company of his own accord. And the the company says like absolutely it it does not condone that sort of retaliation. But um, Enrique's story kind of it it kind of showed me how you could exist in that company and still think you were doing good for the world because no nobody wants to think of themselves as as like a, an evil, profit-hungry person. I think everyone has strategies for convincing themselves that, that what they're doing is morally okay. Well, that's that's a really, really interesting case there that you present, and I think speaks to some of the nuance. Um, and I think related to that, there, there's, a, there's a question pertaining to uh, individuals, not so much just sort of the elite and the powerful that are behind these large companies and the financiers of these companies and so on and so forth, but but you know the ordinary folks, the citizens, the the, the working people, um, is there any argument that perhaps some people kind of want to get duped because the changes that would be required in their lifestyle, uh, 
you know, their way of going about things would actually be quite, quite, quite drastic or great. And so, you know, people that have oil and gas jobs, people that are comfortable with like endless production and consumption as a way of capitalist consumerism, as, you know, people that are fearful of change and, and, and the kind of changes I think we might need at the, at the local, at the individual level. Like, is there anything to be said for that? And can we imagine a strategy or policy to make such people less likely to accept misinformation and disinformation and be manipulated? So I think this sort of question is really speaking to, um, yeah, just the, the experience of people that might recognize climate change is real and happening and we must do something about it, but we don't know what to do and we're afraid of doing something because that might make big changes. So how, how do you speak to folks like that? Um, I, th I think... I, I I agree that there 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 is sort of this like how do I say it this this sort of like ontological comfort that comes from um, believing in the denial um, because it it's it's kind of it's it's sort of jarring to think that um, you know we could be transforming the planet so completely that we kill off um um billions of of species and and permanently alter all of the world's cities like it's is that it's it's such a it's such a huge idea that it's 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 disturbing to think about and um i i think the the denial used to function that way it it gave people an opportunity to say well you know maybe that won't happen um Maybe the scientists are wrong, and I I think now that that's that shifted, and and so many people have seen the impacts of climate change in their own lives. The the denial is is kind of seen as is a bit hardcore in some circles, and and so the 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 new form of it is is through the stuff I was talking about, like with the Pathways Alliance, um, that that actually oil companies are are good faith players in this, and and they're going to get to net zero and that it's it's okay if we keep producing oil because there's a plan to deal with it um and, and so in terms of how you of how you break through to people um you know it's it's interesting because climate change denial hasn't it's only really taken off in in a few countries around the world um canada the us the uk in australia there, there was a moment when climate change denial was gaining steam in China, actually, um, but it was the the deniers were actually um, leftists who argued that um, American imperialist capitalists had created the climate emergency in order to control China. Um, but the, when when the Chinese government um, realized how important it was to the Chinese economy to, to invest in renewable energy and how this could make it a global leader on this sort of thing. Um, the, the, the government really clapped down on, on denial. All the incentives pointed towards believing climate change was real. And the climate denial movement evaporated pretty quickly. Um, similarly, climate denial does not have the same um, political resonance these days in the United Kingdom that it still does in the U.S. and that and that's because there there just isn't really a powerful fossil fuel industry there, and I, I think that's ultimately what it gets down to. The disinformation has power as long as there is is real like vested interests behind it, and so. We wouldn't we wouldn't be having screaming conversations about climate policy if there wasn't one of the world's biggest oil industries in Canada. And, and so when when sort of the the business model for those companies is is weakened and they decline, then the force of the disinformation also declines too. Well, well said, Jeff. I think in the remaining 13 minutes or so, I, I want to sort of turn to the question of, of what might be done or what strategies and tactics sort of folks might uh, employ um, to challenge these continuous processes of disinformation, misinformation. So uh, the, the first question related to that theme um, is, 
Uh, what are the legal challenges to these oil and gas companies based on the evidence that, that you present and synthesize in your work? I mean, is the law a, a useful mechanism for, for challenging these companies? Yeah, I think so. And that that's a big part of the book, too, um, that I didn't really get into. But right now, there are lawsuits against the oil and gas industry in more than 20 jurisdictions across the U.S., um, San Francisco and Oakland, New York City, Baltimore, um, Puerto Rico filed one fairly recently. Um, there's ones in, in Colorado. So there's there's a lot of these lawsuits, and and they all they all hinge on the idea that um, big oil lied to people to protect their profits, which is a form of consumer fraud. Um, and there's there's various legal strategies at at work in in all those lawsuits, but that that's sort of the underlying idea is is that the the companies the companies lied and 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 cities can prove it, um, and and the reason why it's it's cities bringing these lawsuits it's because they're they're the ones that are having to pay right now for climate damages, so there's there's direct you know financial harm that can be proven in court. And, and so, like, when San Francisco filed its lawsuit, it said that, you know, they're going to have to spend billions and billions of dollars on seawalls and other climate measures, um, and, and that the, the, the city would not have to do that if, if the U.S. government had implemented the sort of climate solutions that Obama and others had proposed. So, essentially, if the oil and gas industry had not stood in the way of solutions and, and lied, um, you know, San Francisco might not be on the hook for these billions of dollars of damages. And so that that's the legal argument that's being used. It's it's very it's very novel. Um and and people aren't aren't sure like what what whether that will ultimately be successful, but there's there's some very sort of interesting, impressive people working on these cases. Um one of them is is this lawyer named Steve Berman, who I interviewed for the book. And he was part of the the legal team that led um, a class action lawsuit against the tobacco industry in the 90s. And so similarly, tobacco had studied um, cancer internally and then hid that information from the public and said cancer doesn't, or cigarettes don't cause cancer. And so Berman was part of a, a legal effort along with a whole bunch of attorney generals in the U.S. that, that sort of defeated the industry in court and it resulted in one of the largest corporate settlements in, in history. And, and so now he's trying to use his, his experience and knowledge from that legal fight um, against the, the oil and gas industry. And, and so that, that legal effort is, is way, way more developed in the US than in Canada. And, and in Europe, there have been some really interesting legal victories recently. Um, there was one against Shell, and actually one that was just filed in England against specific um, executives at Shell um, on the topic of climate change. And for whatever reason, Canada has been um, further behind in that. But there, I, I literally just did a, a talk yesterday to an organization on the West Coast called Sue Big Oil that is, is trying to figure out whether there are, are legal avenues um, to bring the oil and gas industry to court in Canada for, for its lies about climate change. So that, that could be one area of of real change, even if these lawsuits are not ultimately successful, they 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 still really force um, judges and, and the public to to consider the facts and and the the evidence um, for these disinformation campaigns. And I, I think they're a big part of the reason that um, we're all talking about this a lot more than we were maybe a few years ago. Great, thank you. Um, I think I'll ask two more questions about maybe the media and informational tactics that could be used to, to counter this misinformation, disinformation. So starting first with, I guess, like large news organizations, you mentioned the role that Rupert Murdoch's media empire has played in creating an echo chamber of climate change, denial and doubt. And clearly there's a long history of news organizations paying insufficient attention to the problem or actually, you know, amplifying, you know, greenwashing or misinformation. Um, you know, not presenting the public with the information it needs to make rational choices in a democracy about how to live vis-a-vis -vis the environment and a sane energy future. Um, 
But, you know, with all of the changes and with all of the movements and all of the organizations that have been operating over the past decade or so, are you seeing like a change in the way that some news organizations set agendas uh, or frame climate change? Like, is there anything new that's happening or are we still seeing a lot of the same old problems being replayed? The, the media often does take a long time to, to catch up, um, but that's that's true of political leaders also. Um, I'd say the big difference that I've seen over the last 10 years is there, there isn't the same hesitancy to connect climate disasters to climate change anymore. Um, you know, we, there was, when there was the, the heat dome on the West Coast recently, and then the atmospheric river that caused millions of dollars of, of damages in the lower mainland in Vancouver, um, Media um, quite quickly linked that to climate change. There, there wasn't there wasn't much dispute, and part of the reason is evolved public understanding, but also the the science has been getting better. Um, I remember a few years ago when there was a a massive wildfire in Fort McMurray. Um, there were there were huge political battles in Canada over whether you could even link that to climate change, like whether that was insensitive and kicking people while they were down. You you don't really see that the same way anymore, um, but I I think I think where the media still hasn't fully caught up is they'll they'll say a disaster is linked to climate change, but they won't say who's causing the climate change. They won't say we we experience this horrible wildfire because of rising global temperatures and. Um, rapid production growth in the oil sands is Canada's biggest contributor to those temperatures. They they won't make that link. And now, will they will they platform your voice and the tremendous investigative reporting that you've done in your book? Have you gotten play by Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or CTV or CBC or NBC or any of the leading or, uh, you know television organizations? So the book has gotten a fair amount of publicity, but it's 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 kind of interesting to see the differences between the U.S. and Canada. Um, in in the U.S., there's 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 less of a hesitancy to to name the oil industry directly, and in fact, there was um, a big there was a year long hearing in Congress about um, oil and gas disinformation and the heads of companies were brought in and questioned under oath. The company's emails were subpoenaed. Um, there, were, there were big loud news events about the oil companies lying, emails published. You just wouldn't see that happen in Canada. Because <laughs> um, the, in, the industry has, is, is, it's, its power is just much more consolidated in Canada. In, in the US, if if you're a powerful industry, it's sort of like, okay, get in line. Like, are you the tech industry? Are you big pharma? Are you the finance industry? Yeah. So big oil just doesn't have the same like cultural power that it does in Canada. But so so in the US, there um the the Washington Post reviewed my book and then they named it one of their top books of, of 2022, which was which is really huge. Um and and it it hasn't been absent in Canada either. I got nominated for a, a major nonfiction award, um, the Hillary Weston Prize. CBC had had a few things about it, but um, we we haven't received any interest from from the big national outlets. Haven't heard from Financial Post, Globe and Mail, Maclean's. Um, although the Toronto Star did write two very nice articles about the book. <laughs> Congratulations on on, on those, uh, those those awards, Jeff. That's that's great. In terms of tactics that ordinary folks can use, or even large organizations or movements can use, like is it enough just to speak truth to power, or to sort of you know reveal the truth in hopes that that will you know move people? You know, in your research, did you come across examples of media and communication strategies and tactics where the disinformation and misinformation of the oil and gas industry was successfully countered? And what did they look like? Like what rhetorical modes were deployed? You know, is it kind of old school culture jamming, social media campaigns, naming and shaming? Like what, what sort of precisely are the rhetorical forms that be most effective at countering this disinformation and misinformation? I think the most effective forms of protest in terms of holding the industry accountable have to do with um, removing its, its social license to operate. Um, 
And, and so one, one example of that we've seen in recent years are, are fossil fuel divestment campaigns. And so that's, that's, that's not e explicitly, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of framed as, you know, a financial action, an institution rem removes its investments. But really what, that, what those campaigns are about is, is questioning the credibility of oil and gas companies as, as positive contributive members of society. Um, so when you have institutions like major universities or whatever saying that this, this industry is not legitimate and it's, and it's contributing actively to dangerous climate change, that sort of starts to affect public opinion. And there's, there's people, people are experimenting with, with a lot of interesting ways of doing that. Um, there, so the, the oil and gas industry is so culturally entrenched that there, there are all sorts of um, actors and institutions that, that sort of hold it up politically. Um, the industry needs um, marketing professionals to design ad campaigns for it. So there's um, campaigns going after those marketing companies. Um, it needs lawyers to, to defend it in court against climate litigation. So in, at US law schools, students are, are organizing um, against lawyers going to work for those companies. Um, they, the, the industry sponsors cultural events. So there's, there's protests against, um, ending that, ending that type of, of support. Um, and it, it, it all sort of, the, the ultimate goal of, of that is sort of reduce the social license to such a point that, um, the industry does not have the political power that it had before. And you, you can see a dramatic example of that in the United States, um, where there used to be, um, there used to be climate denying um, Democrats in Congress um, and Democratic senators that were like blatantly friendly with oil and gas. And, and those, the numbers of those have, have shrank rapidly to the point where the, the industry really only gives heavily to Republicans now. Um, at this point. And, and so that's, that's like one, one impact of, of sort of removing that social license. Uh, the, the last one is that the, the kind of investigative watchdog journalism your book conveys to, you know, so important to informing the public, but it's really risky given the long history of what the industry has been up to, its information, disinformation campaign, and also the fact that at present, many far right wing extremist movements, neo-fascist movements, white supremacist movements are very much still about protecting and promoting carbon against a, a green and clean transition. So do you as a journalist ever feel you know, this risk and this threat? And how, how do you just deal with that at an experiential level as a professional? Luckily, knock on wood, I haven't e experienced anything as, as crazy as on other journalists report in terms of, of harassment or anything. I think it, it probably helps that I'm a young white male. If I was like a woman of color writing on this stuff, I could not imagine the types of abuse that I would get online. Um, I, I think ultimately what, what makes me feel better about what I do is, is, th is that I know really like the, pu the public opinion is on my side. Um, large majorities of people want to see aggressive action on climate change. Um, they see opportunities in a greener economy and, and they don't like being lied to by big companies. And, and so, I, I think it's it's the other side that should feel concerned actually about how marginalized they are. And I think that's that's what makes them so loud sometimes. They're they're actually compensating for the extremely unpopular positions that they hold. Thank you, Jeff. I think that's a fine way to conclude our evening. So thank thanks again so much, Jeff, uh, for your presentation on the petroleum papers. Uh, it was really great to chat with you and I really appreciate the work that you've done and shared. Um, you know, everyone, if you haven't already, get your copy of Jeff's book. Um, uh, thanks again to the CHBE, Petrocultures Research Group, Energy Humanities, Climate Commons Working Group for your support, and, and to everyone uh, that joined us tonight for, for this engaging and, and fascinating discussion.